I am honored that our rabbis have asked me once again, even under these changed circumstances, to offer some reflections named in memory of my wife to be shared on this afternoon of Yom Kippur. When I, like you, will be sitting in front of a screen at home, wishing I could instead be surrounded by so many familiar faces as we move towards the close of this most solemn of all Jewish holidays. Yet our traditions have withstood even greater challenges than the ones we currently face. And the essence of this day remains unchanged. One of our long-standing traditions is that on the afternoon of Yom Kippur, we pause in our focus on our own sins and our hopes for forgiveness and turn our thoughts to those who have died in the near or distant past. The Yizkor service gives us an opportunity to summon forth the names and the memories of our beloved family members. But we also call to mind the fate of Jews whose lives came to end, not by the eternal decree of God that no earthly life will be everlasting, but by the malicious and murderous hatred of people who wanted Jews to die because they were Jews. We engage in these reflections at a time when the entire world is joined in a uniquely shared anxiety about disease and death. The word pandemic comes from two Greek words, pan, meaning all, and demos, meaning people. And indeed, all of humanity is affected. There is scarcely any place on earth where everyday life has not been turned upside down by tiny viruses invisible to all but the most powerful microscopes whose only biological function is to find a hospitable home and then replicate themselves with devastating consequences to the body they occupy. Not surprisingly, powerful vocabulary has been framed to describe this situation. When the pandemic began, many people spoke of the viruses waging war on us, or of us waging war on them. Just recently, our national advocacy organization, CJA, the Center for Israel and Jewish Advocacy, advertised a lecture about facing the new enemy. That enemy is billions upon billions of microscopic viruses. But we Jews have experienced wars and faced enemies before. Eighty years ago, almost all of humanity was impacted by or engaged in a much greater war, the Second World War, and we Jews faced a far greater enemy. Who was that enemy? Was it just one evil man in Berlin who decreed that the Jews had to be exterminated? Or was it all the people who listened to what he said and cooperated in carrying out his intentions? Of course, it was the latter. Consider what happened on January 20th, 1942. The war had been going on for over two years. Millions of Jews had come under the control of the German army. What should be done with them? The Führer's intentions were obvious, and hundreds of thousands of Jews had already been killed all over Eastern Europe. But murdering Jews was still being carried out quite unsystematically. Accordingly, the head of the entire security system of the Reich, Reinhard Heydrich, summoned a group of 15 top government officials and SS officers 
to discuss all this at a meeting. The meeting would be held in a most agreeable location, the dining room of a beautiful villa on the outskirts of Berlin in a neighborhood known as Wannsee. The meeting would begin punctually at 12 noon and would be followed by brunch. And what was the purpose of this meeting? The invitation made clear that it was to discuss what Nazis called the final solution of the Jewish problem in Europe. One of the participants, SS Colonel Adolf Eichmann, had done some homework in advance of the meeting. He prepared a list of the number of all the Jews in each country in Europe, both in those countries already occupied by Germany and those countries they had not yet conquered but planned to. The total number of Jews in all of these countries varied enormously, from 200 in Albania to an estimated 5 million in the Soviet Union for a total of 11 million Jews. Could this huge number truly be eliminated? The minutes of the meeting made it unmistakably clear that that was the objective of the Nazi regime. The Jews will be sent to the East to do labor duty. Those Jews who are able to work will be brought to that region, separated by sex, to do outdoor construction labor, during which no doubt a large number will fall away as a result of an inevitable reduction in their number. The final surviving remainder, who will no doubt be precisely those most capable of resistance, must be handled accordingly, because these, if they were ever allowed to go free, would by natural selection obviously create the nucleus for a new Jewish regeneration as the experience of history demonstrates. That last phrase is worth reflecting on. One hates to concede that anything a Nazi ever said might have been true. But in fact, history has demonstrated exactly this, that whenever Jews have been decimated by their enemies, no matter how drastically, if any of them survived, a process of Jewish revival soon took place and Jewish life and Jewish communities reemerged. This was exactly what the Nazis wanted to prevent from ever happening in Europe again. So those Jews who were not worked to death by forced labor would be eliminated by other means. The meeting at Vanze was not concerned with the operational details by which all this would happen. The purpose of the meeting was different, to make it clear that by whatever means might work, Jewish existence in Europe must be brought to an end. Careful attention was paid to the situation of people born to mixed marriages between Jews and non-Jews. Most would be eliminated. Some might be allowed to live after being sterilized. So eventually, there would be no more Jewish lives in Europe. Having achieved clarity on all this, the participants could now adjourn for lunch. And so they did. By the time the war ended, six million Jews were dead. If the Russian and American and British and Canadian and other Allied soldiers had not successfully defeated Germany in 1945, it might have been almost twice 
as many. The murder of six million Jews, simply because they were Jews, remains the single most concentrated case of organized genocide in modern history. As Jews, we inevitably focus on the horror of what happened to these six million members of our people. But we must never forget that the Holocaust was actually a war within a war. It was embedded within that much larger and numerically vastly more lethal global struggle, the Second World War. The total number of people whose lives were terminated during the war by battles and military action by deliberately induced disease or starvation, by systematic murder, or by bombing from the air, has been estimated at close to 60 million human beings. And the majority of those 60 million dead were not soldiers, but civilians. Millions of human beings were murdered or allowed to die because they belonged to specific groups, all of whose members were considered to be inherently inferior or dangerous or both combined. The Jews were not alone, though they did represent by far the largest single group of humans murdered because of who they were. The Germans also captured millions of soldiers who became prisoners of war. American and British and Canadian POWs were generally treated in accordance with the Geneva Conventions. And most of them were still alive at the end of the war. But over two million Soviet POWs were simply allowed to starve to death because they belong to Slavic nationalities which the Nazis considered inferior. Meanwhile, early in the war, the Germans pioneered the carpet bombing of cities and towns to reduce them to rubble while terrifying or killing many of their inhabitants something which caused the death of massive numbers of civilians. The entire center of Rotterdam was obliterated when the Germans invaded the Netherlands in May of 1940 in order to make sure the Dutch would surrender quickly, which they did. Similar raids soon began on British cities like London or Coventry, though they did not result in a surrender. It was not long before Allied leaders began to undertake actions of exactly the same type. Hundreds of German cities were bombed. And on the other side of the globe, in the struggle against Japan, much the same took place. 1944, Americans became aware of the unspeakably merciless way in which Japanese officers and soldiers had treated American soldiers captured two years earlier in the Philippines. This strengthened the Americans' determination to bring the war against Japan to a crushing conclusion as soon as possible. The firebombing of Tokyo in March of 1945 killed about 100,000 people. And five months later, as we all know, the United States dropped the most devastating weapons ever devised on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. The American decision to drop the atomic bombs is a much debated topic, and arguments can be made on either side. But it would be a profound mistake to say 
that the Holocaust and Hiroshima were just two sides of the same coin. The Holocaust was an attempt to eliminate from the continent of Europe every single member of a particular human community, us in fact because every single Jew, old or young, sick or healthy, belonged to a category of human beings who should no longer be allowed to exist. By contrast, Hiroshima, right or wrong, was a conscious decision to terminate tens of thousands of civilian lives in an excruciating way as a means of bringing the war to a quicker close. They are not equivalent. But what the Shoah and Hiroshima do have in common is this. They took place at a time when millions upon millions of human beings lost their lives due to decisions by political leaders who either wanted those people to die or thought their deaths were an unavoidable and unavoidable consequence of some higher cause, such as ending National Socialism or Japanese imperialism. It was humanly induced mass death that was global in scope. Whether as deliberate targets of hate or considered to be unavoidable collateral damage, human lives were terminated on an unprecedented scale. Today, we are once again caught up in another global conflict, a strangely uneven conflict between human beings with all the resources of modern science and infinitesimally small particles with no purpose or no will, but with the capacity to do tremendous harm to us. There's much confusion about what to do and there are serious debates about how to wage this conflict. But one thing is radically different from what happened in World War II. That is the broad consensus throughout the world that human lives should be preserved. A broad consensus, to be sure, is never unanimous. People have very different ideas about what level of risk is acceptable. There are even some voices that say we are being too scrupulous about saving lives. A former prime minister of Australia has argued that more deaths of elderly people should be tolerated if that is the price to be paid for reviving economic activity. Others have voiced similar ideas. But such statements are discordant outliers in an almost universal agreement that human lives are precious. And if the price for preserving those lives is that businesses must fail, institutions must close, education must be compromised, worship must change, and social lives must become more limited and confined, well, so be it. Preserving human lives comes first. This is, in fact, a profoundly Jewish perspective. We all know that saving even a single life takes precedence over any other Jewish law or commandment. To be sure, this does not mean that Jews are commanded to prolong the suffering of patients who face imminent death. Jewish teaching does not tell us to apply measures to extend life if it simply means that a person who will die will experience more relentless pain on the way to an inevitable end. 
But Jewish teaching does tell us that life is precious and nobody's life should end simply because it would be more convenient to others if this were to happen. We stand united in our reverence for the sanctity of human life. Billions of people everywhere on earth are impacted by this new global conflict. And billions of people are forming and expressing opinions about how to proceed. The voices of a mere 15 million Jews cannot hope to be universally heeded. But we must still do our part to express our values and to make clear that these values apply not just to Jewish lives, but to all human lives. No single community on earth suffered more relentlessly and more tragically than Jews from the doctrine current just three generations ago that people in some human categories are by definition less worthy of continued life than people in other categories. We must do our share to make sure such ideals will never again be allowed to prevail. We can truly hope that a year from now, we will again gather in person in our beloved sanctuary to observe the High Holidays. How beautiful it would be as evening approaches at the end of Yom Kippur to ascend the bima with relatives or friends to stand reverently before the open ark. But we will not be the same people we once were. Our economic circumstances may have deteriorated. Our social circles may have become smaller. Despite the valiant efforts of parents and teachers, the younger generations of our community, our own children or grandchildren or other children whom we know and cherish will have experienced unavoidable deficits in their educational progress. People we love may have died of COVID-19 and others of course will have died of other causes. But in every case, surviving families will have been deprived of the comfort that can come from funerals and shivers and simply being visited by friends and relatives. All this and more will be part of our experience and will make it hard to resume in full the lives we were used to until last March. But no matter, we must at least hope that as Jews, we will know that we have preserved our teachings and our traditions by standing as one in expressing our unwavering support for the preservation of the sanctity of human life. Shana Tovah.